Mercy View. Tonight, I will be reading from Luke 14, 25 through 33. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Is Christianity meant to be carefree? Or is it meant to be marked by something else? Like what does Christianity look like? Um, Or maybe I could ask it this way. What is the shape of Christianity? I just got done reading a fascinating book by a gentleman by the name of Paul Miller. Paul Miller has written a book that has um, gained the attention of a lot of folks in the last few years within Christianity. If you've been interested in strengthening your prayer life, you've probably read A Praying Life by Paul Miller. Paul actually wrote a follow-up book to that that if you like The Praying Life, you should read. It's called A Loving Life where he expounds on and, and, and moves into the story of the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful book. But uh, his most recent book is a book called The J-Curve. And the J doesn't stand for Jesus, although there are um, um, implications about the J-Curve that are connected very deeply to the person and work of Jesus. The J-Curve literally is meant to show us the shape uh, or what Christianity looks like. So if you can imagine with me in your mind the, the letter J, right? The letter J has a short and a long side, but in the middle of the short and long side, there is a dip. There is a a low place. And what Miller does in this book is he argues that the shape of Christianity is this pattern that we actually see in in the person of Jesus in his life, his death, and his resurrection. So if you can imagine that, the 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 earthly ministry of Jesus, his birth, his life, is sort of the shorter part of the letter J. Moving down into the lower part of the J is the, is the death of Jesus. And then moving up is the rising or the resurrection of Jesus. And Miller makes the argument that that is the shape of our Christianity, or at least it should be. To follow Christ means that you and I must die. That doesn't end there, but it absolutely includes death. Death of some kind, right? It's not physical death, although we all will die. Miller's point, the Apostle Paul's theme in the New Testament is that you and I, if we're going to be Christians... If you and I are disciples of Jesus, there is something that you and I cannot resist if we're going to be true disciples, and it is death. So if that's the shape of of Christianity, Christianity looks like that, why do we resist that? Like what's going on inside our hearts, what's going on inside of our minds that we resist suffering, we resist difficulty, we resist challenge, we resist the the bottom of the J-curve. What is the shape of your Christianity? Well, we have been in a series um, over the last seven weeks and we are coming to the finish line tonight called Deeper. And in this series, we have been engaged in no small thing. If you've been with us, you know that we have moved very deeply into the ways in which Jesus calls us to be a disciple of him. And Deeper really captures that because the idea is that we are all in in this sort of 
uh, situation in our Christianity where you and I are um, tempted to sort of just do the status quo. I am. You just sort of do what comes easy to sort of create a carefree shape of Christianity. But in this series, you and I have seen that uh, that is not the call of Jesus. And actually, as the elders of Mercy View have been wrestling with what it looks like for us as we've come out of probably the most disorienting, uh, you know, two and a half years in the church in in the entire world um, for some time now, that we have really come to a crossroads. We've come to a a, a moment in time where um, you and I are called to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And the way that we have described that to you is by really fleshing out the ways that we see our vision and our values playing themselves out in the life of, of, of every partner here at Mercy View. That's what we call members. And we've been walking through all of these different attitudes and actions that uh, will, I believe, result in us being deeper disciples of Jesus. So there is no doubt that over the last seven weeks, these have kind of been come to Jesus moments. And tonight is, is no exception. In fact, I would say that tonight is a night that if you have come in distracted, I just want to encourage you to really focus on Christine and Luke 14, to take this passage and to place it over our lives tonight and ask ourselves some very serious questions. And as we do that tonight, I want to invite you really just to see one thing, and it's this. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must exclusively be devoted to Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus, to be a Christian, to be someone that claims to follow Jesus, your life must be marked by utter, full, exclusive devotion to Jesus. So if you have your Bibles in hand or, or an electronic device with, your, with a Bible on it, keep them open to Luke chapter 14, beginning there in verse 25. Now, if you've been... In the New Testament very much, you know that uh, very often in the ministry of Jesus in, in, in the Gospels, um, there is just like, he's teaching all the time. Like he's, he is um, sharing the, the, the things that, that he wants to get across to the people that are around him about the kingdom of God. And he says a lot of different things. But um, I want you to see if you can catch the theme of some of the things that mark the the teaching ministry of Jesus. This is not um, with our passage tonight. These are some other verses. In Matthew 5, for example, Jesus said this. He said, you have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then just a few verses later, he says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do you even, excuse me, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And then he says this, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. In the next chapter, Jesus says this in Matthew 6. He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. I wonder if you remember the story when Peter asked Jesus, Jesus, how often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? And what did Jesus say to him? He says, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. One last one, Matthew 7. Jesus says this, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide And the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter enter by it are many for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And then he says this, and those who find it are few. Now, there's a lot more like that. But did you grab what Jesus is doing in these verses? 
I don't want you to look for something specific necessarily, but more at a high level, what kind of things are, is Jesus saying to those who are following him? Here it is. He is saying hard things, right? He is, he is saying things to the folks that are following him that, that really challenge whether or not we really are going to obey him, right? Like it, it riles up this thing inside of us like, that's really hard. Am I up for that? Some people have a picture of Jesus that we see in uh, pictures, you know, the, the flowing brown hair of, of Jesus, um, the welcoming disposition of Jesus. And though I think Jesus' ministry and his ongoing ministry actually to, to, to Christians is one that is marked by that, I think if, if we're not careful, we will forget that there is an edge to the teaching of Jesus. The call to be a follower of Jesus in the New Testament is filled with deep sacrifice. It is filled with self-denial and even what we would call a forsaking. And today we come to what could be argued is the most difficult saying of Jesus. Why? Did you hear it earlier? Let's look at it again. Look with me beginning in verse one. Luke starts by saying this about Jesus. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he, Jesus, turned and said to them. And before we read what Jesus said to them, just let's notice something real quick here. Jesus is turning from a group of people that he uh, walked with and, and, and spent a lot of time with, the 12 disciples, apostles, right? who he is investing his life in, his time and energy into. But notice here in this particular setting, Jesus turns from this group of insiders to everybody that was with him. That was the other believers in the crowd, seekers, doubters. If you remember many times on the edges, the margins of these crowds were the religious leaders trying to figure out who this Jesus guy was. And Jesus is getting ready to talk to everybody. In other words, Jesus is getting ready to tell everyone something, not just a select group of people that he is discipling with a unique intentionality. He is going to address everyone. Thus, he's addressing everybody here tonight. Now to verse 2. Look with me there. Now to understand what Jesus is doing here, we have to remember the culture that Jesus was speaking into. It was an Eastern culture. And this is a lot like today's Eastern culture, um, but in this kind of culture, your life revolved around your family. Notice the range of the family members that Jesus mentions here, father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and actually some commentators believe that, that uh, Jesus isn't just talking about siblings when he says brothers and sisters, but, but just brothers and sisters in Christ. So like it could be Friends, in other words, this is a, a, a massive range of people that Jesus is mentioning here. Now, for those of us in a Western culture, which is very secular, which is very individualistic, we need to read this passage through those lenses or we're going to misunderstand what Jesus is doing. Now, Jesus says something absolutely shocking about the family unit here. Right? You heard it read earlier. If you've read Luke 14 before, you know Jesus is using what, again, I think some might argue is some of the most difficult language that you and I have to wrestle with in the New Testament. And by the way, don't miss how radical this would have sounded to Eastern ears. But he says this. Let me just read it again. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, he cannot be my disciple. Why would Jesus choose the word hate? Seems too strong, really, right? 
This is coming from the same person who said that part of the greatest commandment is to love others, right? This is coming from the same person who said, like, we are to even love our enemies. We just heard that earlier. So how can hatred of our family be a Christian attitude for a disciple of Jesus? It actually sounds inconsistent, maybe even wrong, right? But we got to understand what Jesus means here. In the Bible, the word hate, when you see it, absolutely can mean that that something is being uh, despised actively. Like there is, there is um, a disposition towards someone of, of animosity or, or hatred, right? But, but also in the Bible, sometimes the word hate is meant to describe like we are to hate something comparatively, totally, fully. And compared to Leah, she didn't even like make the cut, wasn't even close. So if you press that sort of understanding into Jesus is saying here in Luke 14, Jesus is showing us that he wants out of those who claims to be his disciples something in particular. He is saying this, to be my disciple, you must love me more than anything. You must be devoted to me more than anything, right? Jesus is, again, to Eastern ears, the, the folks that would have heard this originally would have been like, you're, you're saying, Jesus, that, that, um, that this family unit that I'm a part of, that I feel deeply connected to and devoted to and love, you're, you're saying that I'm supposed to be more devoted to you than to them? And Jesus' point here is to say, yes. Jesus is saying this, if you want to deal with him at all, you have to put him ahead of everything. Ahead of your parents, ahead of your family, ahead of your career, ahead of, of, of everything. In other words, Jesus is saying this, full, complete Sacrificial discipleship is the only kind of discipleship there is. There are no two standards. There, there isn't one for the inner crowd, the disciples like that Jesus walked with, and then for the rest of everybody else, there's like another like optional thing. No, he says to be this kind of disciple is to be a Christian. So don't, don't miss this. Jesus is not only talking about importance here now jesus does call us to make him the most important thing in our lives and, and one of the primary ways that we do that is by um, walking out in obedience uh, these sort of rhythms of grace that we get to care and rest and worship serving financial stewardship but jesus is not just talking about priority here He's actually talking about something more. All right, by pointing to all of these family relationships here in this passage where love can be experienced, he is saying, I want your love. <laughs> like he's taking every kind of human love that you and I might run after to find significance, to find meaning, to find importance, and he's saying, I offer something that makes all those loves pale in comparison. And I want to flood every other kind of love that you have with the overwhelming sense of, of love that you and I can have together. Here's the first thing that I want to invite you to see this evening. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must be exclusively devoted to Jesus. In his book Confessions, the, the great St. Augustine, my favorite, one of my favorite church fathers, says that the essence or the key to you uh, finding joy and hope and peace in life, it is not through working hard, 
It's not through willpower. It's not like pulling up your spiritual bootstraps. But rather, he says, the key to, to um, finding all the stuff that you're running after to find that peace, to find that hope, is the right ordering of your loves. Think about it this way. Some of you feel like you have disappointed your parents. Like it's a cloud that follows you everywhere. You, you, you may not even admit it to anyone, but you can just feel it like with you. It, you can't overcome the shame of it, the fear of it. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's somebody else. Maybe it's a spouse or, or maybe someone you were in love with or a dear friend, someone who rejected you and you can't get rid of that sense of failure. Maybe right now you're just kind of really like in, in life right now, just really filled with, with uh, anxiety and fear because you're preaching this to yourself. If I could just have that job or if I could just get into that graduate school or if I could just get that amount of money, if I could get into this sort of relationship, if I could just have this life and then fill in the blank and you're here tonight and the the reality of any of that happening for you, it, it, it seems like it's a million miles away. It's like teetering on the brink and you are petrified. You don't know what you're going to do if those things don't come to fruition. What did St. Augustine just say is the problem for our hearts? Like why we're eaten up with worry or a, a sense of failure or inferiority or a lack of confidence or cowardice or anger or, or bitterness. He says, it's because you love something in your heart too much. Maybe it is your parents' opinion. It's too important to you. Maybe it's your friend or the person who rejected you. They're, they're too important or the money or the career is is too important to you. Augustine says, what are you going to do to get real freedom? What are you going to do to get real peace? Well, there are only two things you can do. First, you can actively try to hate someone else to get freedom, right? You can get freedom by not loving your parents as much or not loving the person who rejected you as much, not loving your career so much, not being as passionate like you kill that part of your heart and harden your heart in that way, that's one way to get a certain kind of freedom. But the other way to get freedom, and it's the way that Augustine is encouraged us to think about this, is to love God more. Actually, Jesus is saying, love me the most. He says the thing that you need to to go from being bitter to being happy and peaceful and forgiving, the thing that you need to go from being inferior to being confident is that the love of Jesus has become so real to you that it has eclipsed everything else. So has it. Can you say tonight that the, that the love of Jesus is so great in your own heart like you've brought it in. It is so real to you that it eclipses all the other loves in your life. That's what Jesus is saying here in Luke 14 to us. He is saying, you aren't my disciple unless that's happened. Or maybe we could say unless that is happening, unless you are progressively in a sanctifying way, finding more and more of your heart is being given to Jesus. But if that wasn't enough, Jesus drives it home further. Look with me at verse 27. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't think when we think about discipleship, there is any stronger way of putting it and, and do you see how strange and unexpected this would have been to use the, essentially like the symbol of execution 
as the image of what it means to, to live the Christian life. Like, he could have come up with something else, surely, right? But that's what Jesus essentially says here. Why? Because Jesus is trying to communicate to us that to be a devoted disciple of Jesus means that you have to make an unconditional decision. In other words, like in these times, and I guess it would be true in these times too, I can't say I've seen this in my lifetime. But back then, man, if you saw someone walking with a cross, one thing that you did know when you saw that person was that was the last thing that person was ever going to do. You don't walk with a cross. The work of Jesus, we, we, most of us, I, I don't know of any Christian that doesn't love that. But in my own heart, and in my conversations with many Christians I have the privilege to walk with, it's, it's not the Savior thing that's the problem. It's the Lord thing that's the problem. I want to be my own boss. I want to be my own uh, Lord. I want to call my own shots. But the deal here is that, that, that Jesus says, if you're going to follow after me, if you're going to be my disciple, you've got to take up a cross. And when you do that, you are making a decision once and for all that I'm your Lord. I'm your boss. Now, when Jesus says to carry your cross here, he is saying that you and I have to make a choice of the heart to be his disciple. In fact, when Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is that if you don't obey him in this way, you're not obeying him at all. Like if you don't obey him unconditionally, if you don't serve him unconditionally, you're not obeying and serving him at all. Like if there are any ifs in your obedience and service to him, you're not acting like a disciple of Jesus. I don't know any other way around this, friends, like looking at this tonight. This, what Jesus is saying, is an all or nothing thing. You either say... Jesus, I'll do everything that you want me to do. I'll obey you no matter what you say. I'll obey you no matter where you send me. Or else you're not obeying him at all. See, there are plenty of people who are in the church who, who are saying, I know I probably shouldn't be doing these things, Jesus. Or I know I should be doing these things. Jesus, I know the Bible is pretty clear about that. But at the end of the day, I just see things differently. I've reasoned this out and I've decided, Jesus, that I'm going to do it my own way. And in the end, Jesus, if my heart is in the right place, I'm still good with you, right? My heart too. If that's how I think about what discipleship is, on what basis am I making those decisions? Am I making them on the basis of how I feel Am I making them on the basis of what culture tells me is appropriate? Am I making them uh, on the basis uh, of, of, you know, what uh, other people are telling me they think I should do? Or am I making them on the basis of the lordship of Jesus, the kingship of Jesus? It's one or the other. And Jesus is saying here that there's nothing in the middle Either you've taken up a cross or you haven't. You're either living in the light of what he has done or you aren't. There's nothing in that middle ground. There is one way. So why are we looking at Luke 14 tonight as we close out our series? I've already said this, but let me just say it again. In short, the pastors here at Mercy View feel like we are at a very um, important moment in the life of our own church and really the, the big C church as a whole. And as we find ourselves regrouping, rebooting a lot of things on the other side of a, of a, of a pandemic, um, we find ourselves asking these questions. And these are some questions that uh, 
really prompted this series and where we want to kind of land the plane tonight and is this what are we going to be about as God's people moving forward and we could ask it another way who are we going to be as God's people moving forward like have we really taken stock of what is at stake in this moment that we find ourselves in or have we sort of just moved back into a with Jesus? What will be said of us in five years as a church? What will be said of us in 10 years, 25 years, even 50 years from now? By the way, I probably won't be around in 50. I, that'd be awesome if I am. But like 50 years means leave a legacy and what will it take to get there if I haven't said it yet we believe that this is a weighty moment it requires something from us so here's what I want to do for just a moment I want us to reflect on some of the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks and as we think about these things I want you to um, place what we've talked about tonight kind of as the grid that you're pressing this through as we think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus again these are the themes that we've looked at over the last six weeks the first one is this um, every partner knowing and experiencing the gospel and so here's the question that you wrestled with in your gospel communities we just want to ask it again tonight and it's this what context at Mercy View do you need to re-engage with in a more regular and active way? It's important for us to be together as God's people. So what context at Mercy View do you, do you need to re-engage with in a more regular and active way? Next, every partner equipped and cared for. Are you currently being equipped? We have a broad definition of that here, but are you being strengthened and built up in your faith if not what is your next step to place yourself in a position to be equipped and and, and are you in a season of life where you need to raise your hand and, and say I could use some real help I, I need some soul care and one of the pastors here counselors here at Mercy View we would love to come alongside and serve you in that next is this every partner engaged in the work of the kingdom like who's your one right that's what we talked about that week how would you share the good news of the gospel with your one if you were given the opportunity next every partner discipled and discipling who are you being discipled by who are you discipling in our gospel communities is in our d groups and if you and mentoring if you need to get connected to a d group we'll be relaunching ministry stuff email us at info at mercyview.com next every partner stewarding their resources so the first question is if if you aren't yet giving to mercy view how could you begin and then secondly, if you are already giving financially to Mercy View, and which of these following areas would you say you need to move towards excelling in? Is it intentionality? You have a plan? Is it sacrificially, your first fruits? Is it proportionally, according to your means, or regularly in a recurring way? Uh, most folks here at Mercy View bless the church through giving online. And if you need help getting connected to that, to help you i think the website is up there at the bottom but reach out to us if you have any issues with that next every partner stewarding their gifts what gifts has god given you and how are you using your gifts already or could you be using your gifts to serve mercy view another question too this kind of came up as we were talking in rgc in a church like ours sometimes there are needs that need to be met 
that don't necessarily line up with your gifting. We recognize that, but like, how can you just serve mercy of you in an area of need? And um, in the, the gospel community handbook uh, in, in St. Louis, where we were living at the time, and, uh, you know, I expected him to be like so excited, so pumped, and be like, man, this is awesome. We want to like help you in every way. And, and uh, like, like, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to do this. And uh, after I shared with him what, what the Lord had um, been showing me, his, his first question to me was this. Could you see yourself, Brad, doing anything else? I was like, that's a bizarre question. I was like, excuse me? He said, yeah. He said, like, I know that you said that you feel called to plant a church, but like when you're daydreaming, like when you're just sort of thinking about like what would be cool to do, like is there anything else that you envision yourself doing? At the time, I had no other thing. Like like church planting was what I felt the Lord was leading. And so I, with all the integrity I could muster up with him, I said, no. He said, good. He said, because someday in the future, in the work of church planning, you're going to have a really bad day. Actually, you're going to have a lot of bad days. And on that day, the only thing that you will have is your call. I don't want to make too much of, of, of the idea of calling, all that kind of like, um, there's a lot of debate about how you figure out what God's will is and all that. But, but what, what the question was from my my friend was this you better count the cost I mean that was the statement embedded in the question is count the cost Brad count the cost what does it look like to count the cost of following Jesus particularly within this covenant community that God has placed you in As we close, I just want to end here. Jesus says to take up your cross, right? He doesn't say take up my teachings or take up my example or take up my advice and follow me. If he did, by the way, you would be crushed spiritually because you can't do that. Now he says, take up the cross. And in saying this, he is saying the essence of discipleship is to realize that when I died, you died. And Paul puts it like this in Colossians 3. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. You died. <laughs> you. But now your life is hidden with Jesus. See, the minute that you place your faith and trust in Jesus, the Bible teaches that you died on the cross with him. The Bible says that you were buried with him. What does that mean? It means God looks at you right now as if you've paid all the penalty for every last cent of sin in your life. Like if you're a person who believes in Jesus and you start to beat yourself up because of your sin, because you feel so guilty, don't. Because as far as God is concerned, you've already been beaten. You've already been flogged. You've already been crowned with thorns. You've already been spared. You've paid it all because Jesus paid it all. Your life is hid now with God in Christ. Now, when God looks at you, he sees what Jesus has done. And every day, you get to get up and remind yourself of who you are in Christ. Like, that's what we're talking about tonight. You, you are going to have to get up many mornings and remind your heart that you've already died. Like, that there is nothing to prove. There's, there's nothing for you to, to measure up against. You're already accepted. But you're going to have to remind yourself of, of what Jesus did in order to get that done in your life. Which means, on the one hand, you, you're going to need to say, I'm living a life of sacrificial service like Jesus. You're following Jesus like the example of Jesus, but it does also mean this. I'm doing it out of the fullness of knowing what he did for me. That's what it means to take up your cross. It means to live a life like that. 
To be a disciple of Jesus, friends, is a radical calling. But we can do it through Jesus. There is a great adventure, friends, that is ahead of us. But we have to make a choice of the heart to enter into this adventure with Jesus. It's going to feel a lot like death. But the good news of the gospel is that it doesn't end there. There is a rising. There is a resurrection. And as you and I live over the course of our life, all kinds of J-curves. What I pray we will find is that not only are we reenacting the life of Jesus, we are becoming more like him. Let's join him in that great adventure. Let's pray together. Thank you.